Here are the 10 rules to optimize your performance because there is science behind the way that your body performs. Number one, sleep for growth, sleep to learn, sleep for speed. I'm going to help you guys out by with why I think this is so important. Sleep is a part of a rhythm of life, right? If I asked what, how many times is your heart beat per minute, you might give me an answer. It beats 60 times a minute, 50, 75, right? That's a rhythm. All rhythms like our heart rate, like our breath rate, they're controlled by the brain stem. So is sleep, by the way, for the most part. The thing is, though, we know a lot about the rhythms of heartbeat and breath. Run faster and your body will try to breathe in more oxygen, so as a result, your rhythm will speed up. The brain stem does that, right? Breathe faster, right, to be able to bring that oxygen. Heart beating faster, just trying to deliver oxygen and get rid of waste. But we forget that sleep is a rhythm as well. And it's a rhythm that is optimal about eight hours out of every 24. It's a rhythm that we must be a part of. Seven to nine hours is essential. I'm going to prove why for you guys. There's a hormone. This hormone, remember, it's part of the endocrine system. It's magical, right? This hormone can grow bone, it can grow cartilage, and it can grow muscle. All of them. Absolutely magical. It can control the blood glucose in your body. That's pretty amazing. Well, it can control the energy system on top of building stuff. It also, if that wasn't enough, can help you burn fat. It burns fat and builds muscle. This one hormone, it's magical. Any, any guesses? What is that? It's called growth hormone. And guess when growth hormone is released most? When you sleep. Growth hormone is released most when you sleep, and it's a hormone that burns fat, builds muscle, bone, and cartilage, and helps you regulate your blood sugar level. Give me that and an inject. Actually, people do that, don't they, right? They inject it because it's so big. All you have to do is sleep, and you can do it. You get growth hormone most when you fall asleep. Also, when you sleep, your nervous system rewires itself, right? You turn short-term memories into long-term memories, right? You don't have as great of a chance of getting injured. Here's what I mean by that, right? When you sleep, you actually have a greater chance of getting injured than not warming up. Because when you don't warm up, you have a one and a half times greater chance of getting injured. That's why your coaches have you warm up. You have a 1.7 times greater chance of getting injured if you don't sleep eight hours the night before. One point, you are better out. If you have to choose between warming up and sleeping eight hours, you should sleep eight hours. You have a reduced risk of getting injured, right, as a result of those. Why? Because when you sleep, growth hormone is released, the nervous system rewires itself, you rebuild tissue, right? You also this, you also get better test scores academic and athletically, you recover faster, you create more force per pound, you learn things quicker, you lower stress, you build it. Do you guys get the importance of sleep as we go through it? Sleep is extremely important. The one that seems to speak to athletes most often is the growth hormone one. All those are true though. Also backed by scientific research, right, of you just sleep and that's when your body actually recovers. It's not when you lift weights that you get stronger. It's when you go to sleep and your body releases growth hormone at its highest level, right? So sleep is extremely important. So what's the best method? How do I do it? How do I fall asleep? That's my second rule for you guys, which we'll get to in a second here. So to fall asleep best, you, you don't do that. If, if you look at electronics right before bed, I got some bad news for you. One, not only do you not get to sleep sooner, that's not even the bad news yet. You don't get as much sleep. Still not bad news. You have a much greater chance of gaining a lot of fat. Study after study after study tells us using entertainment communica communication technologies right before sleep increases fat tissue, adipose tissue. Why? Because you never get into deep sleep. And you know what happens when you get into deep sleep? Your body releases growth hormone, which burns fat, builds muscle, builds bone, builds cartilage, regulates blood. All you got to do is sleep and you get all those things. So you want to know the best way, the best way to fall asleep? You already know the answer. Gosh, I can never get through this history book. I fall asleep. Do that, right? Go read your history book right before or during bed. Go read anything right before bed, right? The idea behind this is if you read before going, right, going to sleep, you get to bed approximately 20, 20 minutes earlier. You fall asleep. 20. That doesn't inspire people. The biggest difference is this. When you read right before you sleep versus actually going through electronics, you get into deep sleep more often, and you, more often than not, you sleep at least seven hours a night. Why is that so important? Because sleep is a rhythm. Sleep is a rhythm that goes through predictable stages. And in the first five hours, you maybe get into REM twice. Maybe. That's if you didn't watch electronics right before. If you, if you, read, if you look at electronics right before bed, you maybe get into REM once, 
before you wake up after five or six hours. But in the last three hours, you get into REM at least three times. It's the reason you're like, man, I was just dreaming and I woke up. Yeah, you were just dreaming. That was near the end of your sleep. That's also when growth hormone is released at its most, right? So if you want to actually build while you're sleeping, turn it off, right? Turn off the electronics. Don't even bring the phone into bed with you. Don't watch Netflix. Turn the TVs off and go to bed and read and you'll fall asleep in no time, right? But this needs to become a pattern in order for you guys to optimize success. So far, so good. So the first two rules have to do with sleep. You might think that's pretty important. The next rule is this. Hydrate for hydrolysis. You guys know to drink water. You've heard it all the time. You've heard it a bunch. I'm going to try to take a different approach to why you should drink water. Right? Your body creates energy right? and builds energy and there's involved in that as a process called hydrolysis. As you might guess, hydrolysis requires a molecule of water. It's found in each one of these times when our body breaks down energy. Every catabolic event in our body, catabolic means breaking down. Right? Every catabolic event requires a molecule of water. Every an anabolic event, anabolic means building up. We've heard of anabolic steroids. Every anabolic event requires a molecule of water. When you put those together, by the way, anabolic and catabolic, you get metabolic, metabolism, right? Your metabolism doesn't even work without molecules of water present. I have a slow metabolism. Drink water, right? The idea here is that water does, is a part of every building up and breaking down process in the body. That's why graphs like this exist. I know that. You guys have probably seen stuff like that, but it doesn't inspire you until you know why. Why? Because your body can't break things down for energy and it can't build things up into muscle. So as a result, your performance decreases. It goes down when, you, when you're dehydrated. And it's real simple to solve. Take your body, divide it by two, and that's how many ounces you need to drink per day. Simple as that. Right? I weigh almost 200 pounds, so I need to drink about 100 ounces. So I carry a water bottle around that's 33 ounces. I drink three of them in a day. Done. That's it. This is outside of your sport practices, by the way. That doesn't count. You need to just replenish water for those. Just during the normal day, right, you need to drink half your weight in, in water. Simple as that. Doing that, and you can build up and break things down a lot better. Hydrate for hydrolysis. Okay, on we go. Rule number four. I don't stop too much because I want to keep going and keep your guys' attention. Rule number four is drink alcohol, right? Say goodbye to six days of training as we go through this, right? Here's the thing with sports. You guys saw the energy systems earlier. When you do something that's really high intensity for a short period of time, you go past what's called your VO2 max, your aerobic capacity. You can sprint for 10 seconds. You can't sprint for an hour. The reason being in sport, we need a bunch of these bursts. In sport, we go past our aerobic capacity, our VO2 max, a lot. Do you guys remember what, what's the thing that can only be burned when oxygen is not there? Carbs. Oh, nice. We remember. Nice. You're correct. Only carbs can be burned when you go past that threshold because they're the only ones that don't need oxygen present. So if we need carbs right, to burn in order to be able to support performance, we need to make sure, because all the, this energy system right here, right, it's using the carbs for us. Go to your sport. If it's moderate to high, you need this energy system. right? Well, guess what? Your body knows this. It stores carbs up for you. It's so nice to you. It stores carbs in your muscles and it stores carbs in your liver because it says, look, we know you're going to need these. We're going to take some to the side. We're going to call it glycogen and we're going to store it for you. And so it looks like this. When you need glycogen, your liver and your muscles give it away. The problem is this. When you drink alcohol, which is a poison to your body, your body wants to get rid of it. But there's only one part that can really do that for you. It's your liver. And your liver can't do it magically. It has to use some sort of energy source to break it down. So it takes its own glycogen and it breaks it down. And it says, I got to get rid of this. It's a poison. This takes priority over anything else. And so it shoots it out of your body, right? But in doing so, it uses up all its glycogen. Often so much so that it will pop down to your muscles and steal glycogen from them as well. So you are taking away from your reserve to do high intensity exercises. Next set of bad news. When you go to sleep after drinking alcohol, you don't get into REM. If you do, it's maybe once per night. The problem is your growth hormone is released most during the third and fourth times when you get into the REM cycle. 
Right? So now, not only have you wasted the day that you decided to have a drink on because your body has used up all its energy reserves, you've also wasted any workouts, right? Because now your body can't build them back up. So now you're on to the second day where it's just trying to replenish en en energy back to these systems. Then you're on to the third day before you get a really good night's sleep and you have growth hormone released again. Suddenly you're down to day four, right? And if you happen to have another sip in that time, say goodbye to three more days on top of it, right? So six days gone where you can't even train. All because, right, our body works pretty mechanically. We know how the energy systems work as well. So make sure you guys understand this. It will devastate your system. Goodbye to glycogen stores. Goodbye to growth hormone being released. If you want to be an elite level athlete, it's not part of your training system at all, right? Because of what it does to your energy systems. On we go. Number five, get real with your food. Now we're on to the food items. Get real with your food. What do I mean by that? Remember this earlier? This is confusing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simplify all of that for you guys. Real simple. Here is the food pyramid you've been waiting for. That's it. Done. It's real food. This is the easiest diet to follow. I'll show you how. You go to the store and you pick items, right, that have one ingredient. Banana. Ingredients? Banana. Okay, we're doing good. Let's try one more. Broccoli. Ingredients? Broccoli. Okay, okay. KFC chicken pot pie. Ingredients? Oof. Okay. <laughs> not one. There's some food in there, but it's not one, right? <laughs> so, the point being, pick foods that are closest to one food item. And if you want to put things together, put real one food items together and make a meal. That's a great way to do it. I've had to add one slide to doing this since I've started presentations like this, right? This one I've always done before, which is, look, if you can pick it, hunt it, or gather it, it's probably a one food item, right? And that's pretty good. And I'll have somebody, I walked in one time, and somebody's like eating a sandwich, and they go, look, Dr. Pertwee, all one food items. And I went, uh, close, right? Just to make sure we understand this, like apple, ingredients, apple, but you guys get like bread, like there's not bread out there, like ingredients to bread are more things. Unfortunately, a lot of bread has sugars in it, corn syrups in it. So just be careful. But then the list is pretty simple. Eat real food. That's your first food rule. And if you guys can follow just that one and nothing else, you'll be doing very well for yourself. But I'm going to go into a little more depth of why it optimizes performance over these last five rules. Six through ten, coming up quick. Protein. We know about protein. Protein gets broken down into little Lego pieces called amino acids. They were build our body. They're the building blocks of all of our tissues, our nervous system, our muscles as well. So here's what I challenge you to do. If you're going to eat meat, eat animals that move as much as you do, right? Because when animals move as much as you do, they have a similar reaction. If you sat here and did nothing and you guys ate processed foods, do you think it's going to affect your body type? Right? Same with the animals. They have the same hormones. They have the same reactions to food. So when you can, eat animals that move as much as you do, not animals maybe that are thrown all together, right? Because it matters. It matters. If it matters to how your body reacts to it, it's probably going to matter how their body reacts to it. So I like this rule, but I'm going to throw a couple more rules on the protein thing to help you guys out. One thing I've found out is that if I pick something that says pasture raised on it, I'm doing pretty good. Pasture raised, for the most part, means they have a lot more space than something like free range, cage free cage, especially something like chickens as well. So, if you don't like my eat animals as much as you, right, that move as much as you do, a fish that swims upstream would be a great thing, right? Then maybe pick things that are pasture raised. That's a really easy label to follow. You don't like that rule? You can go by this rule. This was not mine. This is from Athletes Performance. The less legs, the better. Cows, pigs, they have four legs, right? Chickens, turkeys, they have two legs. Fish, they have no legs, right? So you get the idea here, the less legs, the better. It's probably a better source of protein as you go through it. It's a pretty cool rule and it can work as well. Say you happen to not like to eat uh, meat, right? There are lots of other meatless protein sources out there. Just look them up, there's quite a few. There's lots of veggies and nuts. There's dairy if you're okay with that, right? Um, there is, uh, peas should be on this list as well. They're not up there. I eat about 20 to 30 eggs a week. They're a pretty good source of things as well. Great for you, high in really, really high in nutrients. So it's just the point of, if you're gonna eat protein, know where it's coming from, right? And if you, know where it's, if you don't know where it's coming from, maybe you can follow one of these other rules as you go through it. Because that's the building blocks to the rest of our body. Rule number seven, moving along. Eat fats that improve athletic performance. This one's gonna be really simple. There's no words on this one. Ready? 
Good, bad. See the difference? I'll give you one more. Good, bad. See the difference? Good fats are real. They're real foods. They're avocados. They're fish of some sorts. They're nuts. They're eggs. Bad fats were made up somewhere in a lab, sort of, right? Thrown together. They have a lot of preservatives in them. Bad, good. If you need more scientific stuff behind it, just know this. Your cell membranes are made of fat. The nervous system is wrapped by something called myelin, which speeds up how the nervous system actually fires to your muscles. It's made of fat, right? The most often thing that we see in uh, elite athletes that are pretty lean, they look pretty good, is they don't have enough good fats in their diet. They're not eating fish. They're not eating nuts. They're not eating these fats. Not these, <laughs> not the processed ones, but the ones that actually are real food items. You grab a real food item, I think you're going to be doing pretty well. Coconut included on that. Pretty good? Those fats will improve athletic performance. These fats will not. Number eight, for your carbs, simple. Carbs, eat a rainbow. Every day, right? That's what we mean by eat a rainbow every day. I'll leave this slide up for a second. I'll talk about it while you guys can kind of read. When you eat something and you catabolize, right, that carb, fat, or protein, you break it down so it can be used as energy, what happens is you are breaking chemical bonds. And when you break chemical bonds, there's these little things that get released called free radicals. The problem is, imagine like a little ping pong ball going around inside your body. That's not good. So your body needs to get rid of it. The fastest way to get rid of those little free radicals are through something called antioxidants. You know where you find antioxidants? In real food, right? In food that has color to it. The deep leafy greens, right? The bright oranges and reds throughout here. Fruits and vegetables. They're your natural source. We drink things with electrolytes in them, sodium, potassium, calcium. Do this again. I'm going to make you guys do one more thing. Do this. Calcium was just released into that muscle to make it do that. Do this. Sodium and potassium were just released in that muscle to make it relax. That's the electrolytes. You can get them right here. Oh, you want. Eat as many veggies and fruits as you want. Veggies more than fruits, right? It would be a better thing. I tried this trick, and so I'm going to uh, challenge you guys to try it as well. I try to eat veggies with every meal, every single meal. I first gave this talk to somebody, and they went, how do you eat veggies with breakfast? Uh, like that? In my omelet? <laughs> or like that, avocado on toast, right? As we go through this. Or like that, sautéed spinach and mushrooms. By the way, that was my breakfast this morning. Sautéed spinach and mushrooms, smoked salmon, three eggs, a little bit of potatoes, and coffee. That was my breakfast. You want to know the cost of that? Because everybody's like, ah, oh, yeah, but Nick, the cost. That's, it's too expensive to eat that way. You're right. When I bought the smoked salmon, it was $16 for the big pack that I bought. When I bought the spinach, it was $5 for the pack. $5 for the dozen and a half eggs that I bought. For the potatoes, I paid $3 for the bag of potatoes. My cost, I figured it out, $3 and about two cents. Three, two. Three dollars and two cents for my, all of my meal, coffee included as well. You know what an Egg McMuffin costs? Three fifty. I Less than an Egg McMuffin is how much my breakfast cost. I got way more calories, way better, right, as well, and it took me 10 minutes to make. Show you how at the end it only took 10 minutes to make. That's it. But we can get this if we actually try. So I challenge you guys, can you eat a veggie with every single meal would be a challenge to you to figure out. If you could, you'd be getting all the antioxidants and uh, electrolytes you need. Number nine, almost done here. You guys are doing great. Sugar. You heard LeBron James. He knows it. Your body does not recover as well with sugar. Sugar is a pretty dangerous substance because we like, right? What do you, don't take my sugar away. Right? Sugar is a big problem for us. You eat a little sugar and you'll crave more. The reason being, this is actually scientific, right? The more we found out about the body and the technology advanced, we can look into people's body and see the lighting up of the brain through these opioid receptors. You know what else fires those receptors? Heroin, morphine, yeah, these other drugs. Yeah, absolutely. It lights up an addictive part of your brain and it makes you want more. And it's put in everything. I don't have to show you guys these studies, right? Rats, it kills them. That's what sugar does. Not because we gave them too much because you give them the same amount that you guys are eating over the daily, not necessarily you, but the average American eats too much. How much, right? We eat about 20 teaspoons of added sugar daily, daily, the average person does. The reason being is because it's in our food so much, right? It's added to all sorts of things. The FDA finally passed a rule where the new food labels, when you look at them, it will tell you how much added sugar is on those things, right? But here's the deal, you gotta look for it because sugar comes in lots of names. If it ends in that OSE, it's probably a sugar. 
Even the healthier sounding ones, right, they, when they're added, they add to the sugar content. So even when you guys think it might be something simple, okay, I'm going to grab this thing, it looks pretty healthy, just take a look at the label. A real easy rule that anybody can go by is if it's eight grams of sugar or less, okay. But if it's over eight grams of sugar, put it back. The chances are it's probably not very good for you, right? Also, a good general rule to skip any product that looks, lists sugar as one of his first four ingredients. It might look healthy, great grains, that sounds good, until you look and they have sugar, sugar, brown sugar, corn syrup. Raisin bran, that's great, 18 grams of sugar per serving, right? It's the idea of you don't need that much sugar throughout your day. There are these ideas of windows of time before and after workouts, right? But in general, we don't need sugar right, throughout the day as we just sit there. We'll get spikes in blood glucose. It'll mess up our endocrine system's response to it. So here's some rules. The second one's the one I like the most, but there's some rules. If you want to eliminate sugar from your diet, just eliminate all straight sugars. That might be an easy one to do. I like the eight grams of sugar or more per serving. If so, put it back. You could also try don't drink any calories. The last one, that's tough, but it is a way to eliminate sugar, right? My problem is I think potatoes right, are pretty dang good for you. They'd be fine, but it is a way to eliminate sugars. The main point being here, your sugar, if nothing else, if you're like, oh, I don't worry about sugar, I can run around, just know that it interferes with your body's ability to recover. And that's what sports is about. Can I recover in time for the next game? Can I recover from that workout session where I can get a little bit stronger? Right? If nothing else motivates you, keep that in mind. And here's some simple rules to go by. Okay, final rule. Plan with a purpose. Final one. My last couple of slides here. Literally the last two slides. Plan with a purpose. It's a silly rule to throw in there. When I ask coaches or athletes, hey, what's your strength and conditioning program? They give me something like this. It's just full of how much they're going to deadlift and clean and all that. And it's planned out percentiles, right? When I say, hey, what about coaches, especially, right, to parents? What about as your athlete goes from one season to the next or you want them to peak? Oh, yeah, Nick, I read all about periodization. I know how to change volume and intensity. Get them. I can plan for that. We do that stuff, right? Okay, I say, oh, that, that's great. That's excellent. <clears throat> What about something like, you know, how much your players are running? This is a system I've used before, GPS Sports. It tells us how distance people run in a practice, how many accelerations and decelerations they have, high speed distance, sprints, repeated sprints, how many times on their left leg versus right leg that they cut up. We can measure those things now. We used to measure swimmers when they were lifting weights, and we'd monitor their posture and breath. If they breathed, right, more than eight times per minute, we'd make them slow it down. And if their posture went to... We'd, Technology, it's amazing, right, what we can monitor. Heck, I ask people, you know, hey, what about money in the future? Oh, I got it. We got a plan for that. It's important to me. And I go, what about what you eat? What's your plan there? Uh, that. That's most people's plan for what they eat. Why? It must not be important enough to us, or we must not perceive it to be important enough to us. Somewhere along the way, we were influenced by our behaviors and our thoughts that's for some reason planning. That's not part of food. I don't have time to plan for food. I'm here to tell you, you don't have time not to plan for food. If you want to optimize performance, you want to be the absolute best you can be, the strongest you can be, create the most force per pound that you can, right? Jump the highest, swim the fast. It absolutely, you absolutely need a plan. So here's my last bit here, right? When I, when I Googled, by the way, the plans, right, for athletes, this is what came up. This stuff, then this stuff, then this stuff. In other words, athletes are doing it. I saw an article like this. Russell Wilson has dropped his b body fat by 6%. A lot of you athletes did your body composition today. Again, those machines will be around for a while. You guys can come do them. Right? How do you do that? They give his meal plan. Look at his meal plan. He wakes up in the morning. He has a tablespoon of almond butter and a tablespoon of jam. Yeah, good healthy fat, some protein, good, good simple quick carbs to get him ready. Afterwards, he has two cups of cooked oatmeal. Pretty good protein source member. Six whole eggs, chicken breast, and fruit. Right? Later on, he eats fruit and 12 almonds. I'll let you guys keep reading what he ate for the day. How can he eat 12 almonds? I'll tell you how. Because there were 12 almonds in a Ziploc bag, and when he was ready to eat them, he grabbed the Ziploc bag and threw them in his mouth. He didn't count them then. He planned ahead of time, or he had somebody plan for him ahead of time, right? This was already planned out so he could eat it no problem. You guys can do the same thing, but it takes a few steps. I'm going to show you the last things here, right? First is you have to write it down. That's not, that's not even something that, that is like a suggestion to your psychology. That is biological. The prefrontal cortex of the brain fires when you write something down because it's the part of the brain that, that takes into consideration language. 
the emotional part of the brain, the limbic region of the brain, the part of the brain that tells us, go get that egg McMuffin, right? That part of the brain shouldn't be making all your decisions, right? So write it down so the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that's rational, takes it into consideration. And then schedule a time to actually make the food. And then plan for ways to eat real food and make it as convenient as possible. And don't make the plans when you're hungry, right? Don't go to the store when you're, when you're starving. But it requires that. It can be simple. It could be that you just have a bunch of food that you like and then you're going to make a list and check those off. That's no problem. That's one way to plan for food. Another way to plan for food, this one doesn't work for me, but I know athletes that like it. They say they look at their plate every single time and they're going to put half their plate as vegetables and fruit every time. Then the next biggest part, right, they're going to try to put some sort of protein and then they'll put these grains over here or fats on the side. If that works for you, awesome. That's a plan. Sometimes all you need is rules. Maybe this is a good plan for you to start. But you have to follow it, right? The idea behind a plan is it has to be written down and we have to be able to follow it. My challenge to you guys today is hopefully one, that you got some science behind the stuff of why this optimizes performance, is but also to keep it simple. That's a food pyramid, right? That's a really good food pyramid too. Because if that can become your new food pyramid, you can fill in the rest of the stuff. There's all sorts of technology with apps out there that we can track every macro, micronutrient we want. And count. Start with just eating real food. And if you start eating real food, make a plan to keep it going. But you have to make it so it's something convenient for you guys as you go through this. I appreciate you guys' attentiveness. It's dark, so I'm just assuming you guys are all awake still. They went through this. I appreciate you guys' attentiveness. Thanks for listening to this. I'm going to hang out for a bit. If you guys have any questions at all, please let me know. Thanks over here.